Please note, before we begin this episode, a content warning. Father and I will be discussing topics of an adult nature and speaking frankly about issues touching on the Sixth and Ninth Commandment, among others. While these are important issues and Catholics must be aware of the morality of these topics and not just ignore them, turn a blind eye to them, this episode would not be suitable for children. And parents are encouraged to listen to this before prudentially judging whether their high school-aged children or above should listen. We'll pause here for a few seconds so you can determine whether to skip this episode or continue on. On today's episode of the SSPX Podcast, we'll continue looking at the concept of morality with Father Palco. We were looking at morality in a theoretical, principled way in the last two episodes. Today we'll be discussing specific moral issues and tackling what the world sees as controversial and outdated opinions about sexual morality, abortion, euthanasia, organ transplants, and much more. You can find notes to all of these episodes at sspxpodcast.com slash apologetics, as well as all of our previous episodes. There as well, you can find a link to help support this project. This is free to listen to, as well as all the resources we are posting. But if you can help with a one-time or a small monthly recurring donation, you'll be making sure that we can continue this work of producing good Catholic content on a regular basis. Now let's join Father Ian Palco for episode number 34 of the Apologetic Series here on the SSPX Podcast. Father Palco, it is a pleasure to have you back again for third time in a row. Are you sick of me yet? Oh, not yet. It's Andrew. Oh, that's it's, nice. It'll of you. take it'll take a few more times, I think, before we're that. <laughs> or or we'll stop no. recording and uh, you can tell me what you really think. Yeah, that, true. Okay. Well, we're not doing that now. <laughs> uh, so again, just uh, just to reiterate, we did uh, mention this at the very beginning at the introduction. Uh, but Father, today we are going to be uh, talking about some issues that may not be suitable for all audiences. Is that right? Yeah. So, I mean, we're going to talk, um, and the title that I've given to it, and I'm not sure what it'll translate into what, what you put on the, the actual podcast, is more specific and controversial topics. Not that these are actually controversial topics, but um, they're, they're, they're suitable for those who need to know about the morality that Catholics teach. And, and the Catholic teaching, but a lot of it gets into more specifics. I mean, it's nothing that you're, if you're just wandering around the internet, YouTube, even modern culture today, you're not going to hear about, but, you know, it, especially for those who would just, you know, turn on the SSPX podcast, who would just um, let somebody just, you know, go through something. We're going to talk about things that are a bit more sensitive, we'll talk about things yeah. that touch on the sexual morality the Catholics teach, why that's the case and identify certain things that are immoral and moral. Um, and if if a parent hasn't really done their job and uh, prepared their, their child, for instance, for uh, understanding these things, might not might be a good opportunity for them to do that, but it also might not be the podcast to let them just listen to without at least a little preview or some viewer from discretion, at least yeah. uh, to begin with. Some of the topics will be important, but I think we want to put that out to begin with. This is I mean, St. Paul says, for instance, let these things not be named amongst you, but they're out in the world and we have to talk about them in order to help prevent sin and, and direct people towards the natural law, as we've talked about in previous episodes. So a little warning Absolutely. there, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, in the previous couple episodes, we've been talking about morality in general and the fact that there is an objective morality. And like you said, now we're going to get into some of the specifics mm -hmm. uh, in, in the moral code uh, that, that mm -hmm. does exist. Yeah. And uh, I think it would be good to just briefly review our principles there, because I know probably for a lot of people, those last couple of episodes on that were informative, but, you know, a bit dry. Um, and we were trying to present the, the principles so we can argue from them. This gets a little more spicy, as it were, in this episode. Um, but morality or ethics, we, we said before, that was that study, uh, the questions, the standards by which we're going to judge men's actions and how men should rule their actions. And then we're going to compare in morality those actions with the actual standards that we've established. They are objective, those standards. They're rooted in the divine law. We called it specifically the natural law. And we said that that was really just a relationship between God and man based off of the nature of God and the nature of man. 
and the rest of creation existing as a result of the nature of God and the nature of man and how then man has to fit everything into there and use those things. Um, there's also, we said, something called divine positive law. So when nature itself, man's nature doesn't establish how he should act, God's nature doesn't establish how man should act in a particular situation, sometimes God will make somewhat arbitrary decisions. For instance, we know from natural law that we have a duty to worship God. That worship is going to look like a sacrifice. It's going to be a priesthood that does that. Um, but then the divine positive law gives us exactly how that's supposed to be done. It extends that. It extends that to saying, you're going to go to Mass on Sunday, and the Mass is a sacrifice, and it's going to be done in this way. And before the Mass existed, before Christ's sacrifice, it was the temple sacrifice, and then the Gentiles had a different way that they were going to honor and worship God, for instance. But it's God's decisions, his arbitrary decision that set that up. But there already is something behind that, not just an arbitrary decision, a natural law that establishes the worship itself. So... There's divine law, and that's separated into natural law, and then divine positive law. We'd also said in a, in a little review here, it was all about finality. This natural law is all about the purpose or the goal of man. When he acts according to that nature that he has, he pursues his proper goal, he acts towards that goal, towards his final end, and as a result of that, he acts well. When he doesn't do that, when he doesn't act according to his nature, he moves further away from his goal. He acts against nature. He acts immorally. And then the specific actions, moral, immoral, are basically just a, an application thereof. Right? We can see the functions that man has, whether these lead to him using them correctly, using them towards his natural end, his proper end. And, and that's how we're going to set up how we judge things as Catholics or in, as in apologetic series, how the Catholic Church does this and why it's reasonable. And that is kind of important. This way, feelings, emotions, our truth or subjectivism doesn't really enter into the question. There are circumstances, there are intentions, and that's important. But as we said before, there will be that moral object. And that's going to be really important throughout this whole episode and the things we talk about. What does this thing that we're doing firstly seek out? That'll answer so many questions um, as to whether it's good or bad or whether it can be done or not be done. Um, we have to do good, avoid evil, and that's how we're going to do it. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, it's interesting. I was just um, talking with some high school students earlier about uh, Amoris Laetitiae, and it, mm -hmm. it dovetails directly into this. And, and indeed, uh, there was a lot of. Uh, I'm looking at it right now. It says, uh, um, "You're going to thoughtfully take into account your own welfare and that of the children, those already born, those that the future may bring. You have to reckon with the material and spiritual conditions." So it's, it's basically saying morality within marriage. Well, there's external factors too. And it even mm -hmm. says you should consult the interests of the family group and of temporal society. So, you know, before you decide to have children, I have to go talk to my neighbors. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm exaggerating a bit, but is that kind of well, what I you're mean, talking about? This, it's, this idea it's not, that it's not really an exaggeration. It's, it's maybe the unforeseen um, consequence thereof, but a lot of these very personalist and sort of subjective ideas about these things, they may try to answer and solve a problem, it may be a legitimate problem, um, but they try to do so with principles that eventually, if you take them to the logical end, it's, it's, it's very much like the society's objection to certain things in Second Vatican Council. You, you start there, and it's a false principle, even if it's not too far off. But once, you, once you've asserted that principle, it just blows the whole thing up, and somebody can take that and run with it to its logical conclusion. Um, a perfect example of this, though this isn't the subject of morality, is Cardinal Journet, a very great uh, theologian. Um, he eventually has to agree with um, some of the heretical ideas of like the anonymous Christianity about, about the, the idea of how the church is constructed, which that's an entirely different thing. He's a good theologian. He comes up with the idea because he has a few just slightly off principles that sound okay, but you know, it blows everything up. And he sort of has to begrudgingly agree with, with liberals. And, and this is, for instance, at the council. And so his, his treatise on the church is, is an absolute mess, even though it's very intelligent, whereas his theology on the Holy Ghost is beautiful and it's, it's very good and solid and orthodox. It's, 
But as soon as we blow up that idea and we turn it into personalism, we, we start thinking that the circumstances of an action, like for instance, morality, it's the circumstances that tell us whether it's good or bad. That's, that's relativism. Or it's my intentions. That's another kind of relativism. It's my purpose. It's my intention. It's not the thing itself and what it actually seeks out. There's the problem. And it, this is just this is this is part of the problem of the moral subjects we'll talk about today. We we start thinking that somehow our good intentions can turn something that's evil into something that's good, or an evil intention um, is it just you know is okay if everything else turns out okay. You know it's bad, but it's not that bad. Whereas an evil intention will just poison everything. It makes an act which otherwise is good very immoral. Um, and this is really important to keep in in line with, or, or in, in mind when we're going through these moral subjects or these topics as it were. And, right. uh, I would say if we're mentioning Morris Laetitia, it sort of brings up the first thing that we were going to talk about as a yeah. bit of a segue there. Um, and maybe I didn't see that you were trying to do that here, <laughs> but in any case, it, it, whether you were intending it, or not, it sets us up really, really well for the first kind of delicate subject. So again, yes. this might be something that if, you know, a younger audience maybe is not ready to, to look at things as straightforward and clearly, maybe it needs to be presented in a different way. So maybe yes. this is a good opportunity to kind of skip ahead. Um, mm -hmm. But I think talking about, it's always, it's something that's, we can even talk about a first objection when we talk about the sexual morality that the Catholic Church holds and teaches here in general. Um, you hear it very often. And it, there was even a fairly recent incident of that with uh, the new Speaker of the House, not a Catholic. Uh, maybe one day he will be. He seems to have some good moral bearings on him. We'll see. Um, but you can you hear this so often. It's like uh, kind of a refrain that traditional Christianity, traditional Catholics, you always talk about sex and group rules and all of these other things we're just obsessed with with sexuality we're obsessed with these things and that's probably of course because you know we're all just you know repressing these desires and things like that and you know we're really the criminals here and it's just virtue signaling if if we really found out how we actually were okay yes we have to admit and and it's let's be honest there are plenty of problems amongst clergy amongst the church even within traditional Catholics, traditional Catholicism about these type of things. Not surprising. Stand around a campfire enough, you're going to smell like smoke. Not surprising that we're exposed to the world as it is today. We're going to come off with some of these vices and with some of uh, you know, clergy, priests, things like that. We're going to come off with some of those vices, even if otherwise we're trying to be good people. Weakness will have its way. Original sin is not too inventive. Um, these problems have existed before. They were hidden in certain ways. So, you know, it's, but it's not an obsession. It's not an obsession. Woe to you, as the scriptures say, that call evil good and good evil. Uh, this is written, as I said, put on display with with uh, the new Speaker of the House, uh, Mr. Johnson, who he back in 2022 uh, used, mentioned that he and his family use uh, a piece of accountability software I think it was called Covenant Eyes. It's one that I think people have recommended in a lot of places. Other Catholic channels have recommended to avoid looking at impure and pornographic images online to try to keep our behavior online good. And he said he used it and he recommended to his son that he use it. And he made himself the accountable to his son, probably because he had a good habit of not looking at bad things. So his son would trust, hey, if dad's putting these rules in place, he's keeping them. He's not a hypocrite. Um, we can be hypocrites too, but you see the, how the world spun this and the headlines were saying he was sharing his pornography habits with his son, which oh. is, is just disgusting. Um, so they're turning not, a, a virtuous act into something yeah. weird and so deviant. He's trying to be a good father and protect his children and teach them virtue and turning that into exactly the opposite of what it is. But that's the thing is the people who are who are welcoming all manner of these kind of deviancy are so quick to label Christians who are trying to protect themselves and others from their passions and concupiscences with these kinds of labels. So it's it's an empty objection to start with. Why do we talk about these things? To help protect ourselves because we know we're weak. 
I mean, the priests themselves make sure we use this kind of stuff too. Why? Because, you know, in a lonely moment, in a weakness or something like that, the devil is really good and he can, and our human nature is very weak. We, we have to recognize it ourselves first. Um, and that honesty and that lack of trust in ourselves because of our broken nature is really important. It's, it's, we'll, we'll never grow in virtue if we don't have that to begin with. But, um, but at the same point in time, it must be admitted that there are plenty of deviants and sinners amongst Christians. Um, I, it, it's not, it's not untrue to quote the Pope, and he says it's a field hospital. It, it is. It's a field hospital where you know improving and going out in a battle and not just being wounded by these things. But it's not surprising you'll find sinners amongst well sinners in the church. Not surprising that. But the reason that the church even brings up this whole topic, the reason that Christians bring up these topics isn't just because we're Victorian Puritans who are really, like, you know, repressed. It's th these things are so closely tied to our nature. The propagation of our species is an instinctual drive in animals. And guess what? We're a rational animal. It's not surprising that we're going to have this drive. Yes, we, as particularly as religious and as priests, we set aside that. We try to contain this. We try to, to direct that drive towards sanctity by giving it up. Um, it's difficult. It's one of the reasons the cast, we wear the cassock. It's a sign of our death. It's a reminder that, that we're not supposed to. We've chosen a certain path. It doesn't work all the time, but it's a reminder of that. Um, but it's also a reminder of for us, priests and religious, that we're fundamentally wounded. Our nature is broken at its core because we broke it, and only grace can fix that. So our passions, our appetites in the soul are going to get out of whack. They're going to be, and they're going to seek things out in a disordered manner. And so rules and guidelines by the church are precisely to help us to put these things in order and to make sure that we do so. Add to that especially when it comes to sexual morality, the pleasures that are associated with these kinds of things, both physically and psychologically. Remember, you know, these kinds of acts release endorphins, dopamine, various other things, there's physical pleasure. These things are addictive. It's not surprising. I mean, pornography itself is highly addictive. I mean, you have people who are completely secular and not religious at all saying these kinds of things and going on these crusades to, to end pornography. It's you know, the, the people realize this is a problem, and it's obviously a problem that isn't just religious in nature. And there's plenty of historical examples to show that sexual license and not restraining ourselves in this way lead to horrific problems and horrific problems that affect not just individual men or families, but entire societies. I'm going to quote a couple of biblical examples here, um, perhaps, but, you know, that's not because we're, we're saying, oh, Revelation teaches us this. It's a historical event that shows us, you know, terrible things can happen when a man is not virtuous and trying to restrain himself and put himself in order. Um, you're, you're familiar, I'm probably sure, with in the second book of Kings or Samuel, if you if you use the uh, the newer version of this. So the second book of Samuel, second book of Kings, um, David. You know, David's this man after God's own heart, as I said. He's, he's this this man who is trying as best as he can, at least at certain times. Um, he's trying to, um, he's trying to do God's will. He knows that he's been appointed by God. He's been anointed by God. And Samuel has done this. Nevertheless, he's a weak man at times. And in the 11th chapter of second Samuel, second Kings, um, he shirks his duty of fighting. It's the time. It's the spring time. They're supposed to go out and fight. That's what Kings and that's what men do. They go out and fight and he's staying home and lounging about. He's indulging in his passions and he indulges him to the point of seeing uh, Bethsabe, Bathsheba, as, as she's called in other translations, laying on her, her, her uh, rooftop, and he goes and commits adultery. And not only does he do this, his, his passions are not in order, so he does something bad. Okay, that's bad enough. But then he takes that and he tries to hide it. And to do this, he disturbs the battle, calls in the husband of this of, of uh, Bathsheba, Arias, and, and he tries to get him to, okay, try to hide this problem. Why don't you go and spend some time with your wife and everything? And then when that doesn't work, because this man is really virtuous and committed to this cause, unlike David, he arranges for his murder. So you see, just one act of passion at one moment leads to murder. And all of this lying and everything like that in the meantime, and deviation. Solomon, his own son, 
a little bit later in the books of Kings, first Kings and the, uh, the newer enumeration of things, third Kings and the Douay Rheims and the, and the Septuagint. Solomon, he's not exactly the most um, monogamous type of person, right? He, um, he has uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of about a thousand women who, who flock around him. 700 are his wives. Um, in reality, one is his wife. Um, but there are 700 that are considered wives and 300 that are concubines. And amongst these are a whole lot of pagans, particularly pagans who worship Moloch. His desire and his unwillingness to bridle, despite his wisdom, he's one of the most wise men. People come from all around to, to you know, because of his wisdom. People give him all kinds of gifts for this temple that he's building because of his wisdom and his virtue in other ways. And yet here, he is unwilling to bridle his passions. And this leads him into idolatry and eventually sacrifice, child sacrifices to Moloch of all things. He ends very badly. One of those who in scripture probably, probably despite his great gifts, did not save his soul. Oh, there's different traditions on that either, but certainly a lot of penance to do if somehow he did in the end. Secular example, Henry VIII, right? Here's a Catholic ruler who has a bit of a problem with purity. And he's, because of this, lots of venereal diseases that he was probably part of the problem for him conceiving a son, his wife conceiving a son. Um, but he divorces as a result of not conceiving a son to chase after a younger woman and then breaks with the church to do that so he can get this decree of divorce, sets up an entirely new religion that's based off himself. He martyrs lots of Catholics, he destroys monasteries, he steals their money, he murders his own wife, he sets up England and basically in the coming years, as it's going to be a colonial power, spread a false religion all around the world. Um, not good, not good at all. And these are just historical examples that show how quickly an, a, a problem with our passions that isn't bridal, sexual license, will just lead us down all kinds of horrific paths. And I'm sure there's thousands of other stories. We can even think modern times, right? 1950s, leave it to beaver, family situation, you know, and, you know, you hide a lot of these things because maybe you're a little Puritan, okay, but maybe things are just, that's the way they're talked about. And now, not 50 years, 70 years later, people are undergoing life-changing surgeries and chemical treatments in order to get certain pleasures for themselves. And this stuff is on full display. And yeah. yet, 70 years ago, it wasn't that way. So you can see how just some small little errors here, a license to our passions when it's not restrained, virtue isn't practiced. Here we go. Yeah. And that's the response of the church, right? The church says, here are the rules, not because we're obsessed with this topic. In fact, we'd rather not talk about it at all because we'd rather people just be virtuous and then we wouldn't even have to put it guardrails. Right. But people are obsessed. People are obsessed with this thing. And so the church has to respond to their obsession, their possession with their passions and their sins that so easily direct man away from his eternal goal for a long time with permanent effects. Right? Think of just a, a situation in which a, a man and a woman set up a family that isn't good or a, not a family, but a child out of wedlock. It, it has repercussions for that child's life his children's life and various other things. It, it's You don't have to think through very far to see that if virtue isn't passed on, if rules aren't kept, it goes very badly, very quickly. Well, and, and kind of like what you were saying, and I and I guess this is your, your segue now, we're both very good at segues today, it seems, uh, that this is not just a Catholic church issue. Yes, you are a Catholic priest. This is a Catholic podcast. However, these aren't, this is way more than just a Pope said so, and Father Palco is saying so, it is, it's natural law. It is logical that these it, rules precisely, be followed. Precisely, right? We're going to draw out specific sort of conclusions to help people say, hey, yeah, that's wrong. You can't do that. Or it might be okay, but you can't do that. Or we're going to draw out specific conclusions because the principles lead us there. But the principles aren't, hey, yeah, scripture says this thing, or, you know, the Pope said that thing, or, you know, a bunch of, you know, old guys in the fourth century decided this thing. It's because this stuff flows from the, from, from the final cause, what we are and what we're meant to be, from what our nature is and what that's meant to do. Um, so you could say, though, I, I'm sure there are plenty of people who would argue that everything is religious. Every conflict is religious, even political conflicts. And that's not untrue. It's, that's an entirely different topic, I'm sure. But these things we're going to talk about today aren't religious doctrines. Yes, the church teaches them, 
right? I, I, I always get this, you know, what do, what do you believe, right? Oh, do you don't believe in that? Or you do believe in that or various other things. But you believe contraception is wrong. No, I don't believe it's wrong. I know it's wrong. Uh, I don't believe this thing if I know and accept the moral doctrine that it is wrong. I don't believe that it's wrong. I, I have it proven to me that it's wrong. And so we don't do that kind of thing. It's not the doctrine. It's not my belief. It's not my personal subjective assent to this truth that makes it right or wrong. It is wrong. The church is just reflecting that it is wrong and reminding us that it's wrong because the church wants to help prevent sin, ultimately. Um, that, that that's I think that's really the core issue here is that what we're talking about from natural law, and we're, we're rarely going to cite a, a, any instance of the church teaching its through its magisterium something, scripture teaching something, a pope saying something, or some rule here in canon law or various other things. We're not going to even cite that in most cases, except maybe as a support and, you know, in an ancillary way. But we're going to say the natural law says, and here's the conclusion, and we use our reason from it. The re our reason can come to these truths with just a little bit of clarity and a little bit of explanation. Okay. So where are we going to start? What's the first thing that we will look at in the in terms of natural law in this in these series of topics? Well, I think we get so many things wrong today that we need to at least go to at the beginning, right? In the beginning, there there was, you know, et cetera. Um, we we'll go back to, the, back to the beginning. And in Genesis, and while I'm citing scripture again, too, this is something that can be shown from natural law. But we know that God makes man and woman. And so the very basis for Catholic sexual morality is going to be this idea that there are two on a biological level. Okay, we can talk about various social contracts and various other things. That's that's yet an entirely different uh, track down there and, and not something that we need to get into right now. But we can say that there are two genders or two sexes that biologically the human species exists in. There is a male, there is a female. And while that's a controversial point today, and it shouldn't be, we, we do see that, that that's the basis for these things. We In order to reproduce the species, that is what you need. And it, it, it goes beyond our own species too. Into the higher animals, you don't find a, you know, odd ver versions of this thing. You have a male and a female. Yes, once you get lower, you have you know, uh, sort of uh, asexual reproduction. You have various things where you can have two, a, a um, parthenogenesis and various other things. But those are always the lower animals. In the higher animals, which are reflective more of the creator, those are going to be male and female. That's how he created us, as Genesis says. That's that's an important first point because all of our all of our sexual morality is based off of this. There are, yes, of course, certain individuals that will have non-standard genetics, but even so, we're always going to be able to, in almost every single case, I mean, the, 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 this is a bit of a canard that's always brought up. We're going to be able to show that biological characteristics will show this individual to be male or to be female. Maybe a little bit less, maybe some traits or are less male than others or things like that. But we're going to be able to clearly identify in almost every case without with, with very few exceptions. Example, you and I both share 46 chromosomes. Well, we don't share them, but we each have 46 chromosomes, right? You and I both have in that the 46th uh, with the 45 and 46 there, we have an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. These are the, called the sex chromosomes, right? So an X will, meet, will, will come from mom and a Y comes from dad, right? In the case of a, a female, you have an X from mom and an X from dad. So a man can give either one, right? Um, this, if, it, if you have X, X, you have a female. If you have X, Y, you have a male. That's normal. That's, that's the standard this standard set of genetics that a human being is meant to have. However, there's plenty of examples where this doesn't happen. But in almost every case of these variations, if the child lives to, to become an adult, you still are going to be able to identify very clear male or female characteristics. As a general rule of thumb, if you have a Y chromosome at all, you will have a male. If you have an X chromosome at all, or two Xs, or a lack thereof of a Y, you will have a female. So some people have 45 chromosomes. They're missing one. 
they only have an X chromosome from mom, but they didn't get anything from dad for some reason. Okay, this is called Turner syndrome. And the people there are often infertile, but they're clearly female. If you have an extra X chromosome, but, a, but with a Y, XXY, well, that's Kleinfelter syndrome. It's a male, he's typically infertile, um, but he still is very clearly a male. Yes, with some other characteristics, et cetera, but very clearly a male in most cases. XYY, a kind of super male here called Jacob syndrome. It's a, he's a male and he's actually quasi normal without a whole lot of other things. It, quite, he's usually fertile. Sometimes people don't even know that they have this. A triple X, trisomy X, female. Sometimes people don't even know they have this. They're quasi normal as well. And there's very few times where there, there's a mosaicism or chimerism. Um, where people exist where they have certain cells that are one of these and certain cells that are the other one. It does happen, but it's pretty rare. Example, there's an often quoted study by Anne Fausto Sterling, and she suggests that 1.7% of all births are intersex. They're somewhere between male and female because of these conditions. Hmm. Um, that's a number that's often quoted, you'll find out there. But there's another, Dr. Leonard Sachs, who is pilloried a lot because he doesn't agree with this. He says, well, if you actually look at the statistics, 1.5%, so 1.7 minus 1.5, we're talking about now 0.2%, right? 1.5% are genetically normal people who just have a late onset a condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which can affect how they appear in, in, in their sex characteristics. But doctors... And the, the wide majority of doctors would never consider that of these intersex people. They would say only in a strict sense that the people who are sort of ambiguous to, as to whether they're male or female represents perhaps 0.018% or somewhere in that range. So we're talking about a, a, an incredibly small number. But even in the case it was 1.7%, it's such still a small number that it's a demonstration of the order and the rule that the normal thing is to have male and female, and these are exceptions from there. It doesn't mm -hmm. establish that somehow those exceptions are normal. If if 1.7% of, for instance, the church population gets cancer, you wouldn't say most people get cancer, right? Most right. people are, well, we have to take into consideration cancer, right? It's it's not a common trait. It, or normal, you it normally is this other way. Or you wouldn't change all the entire church teaching to focus on people who have cancer. Exactly. Right, right. You wouldn't, it, it might be a concern because that means almost, you know, two out of a hundred people and that's not nothing, right. but it wouldn't be, uh, you wouldn't hyper-focus on something like that. Right. You wouldn't say that this is seriously something we have to take in. You know, we have uh, unemployment rates that are higher than that. And we're <laughs> not too concerned when they get down in like the five, 3% type. We're not right. concerned that those are still too high. Right. Um, okay. In any case, that's a little bit of a, Sort of a, uh, not a segue, but uh, we're going off track there. But um, we could say because of all of that, we have two sexes, and you know the statistics bear that out. And those two sexes are biologically complementary. They're designed in such a way that they, when you have a man and you have a woman, through the normal pr pr practices, through the normal sexual intercourse that happens, man and woman will provide complementary genetics gametes, and the child that is conceived is going to be able to be nourished and grow in the woman's womb. And we can, we can even say that that's going to be our minor premise here. We're going to set out a syllogism. So the minor premise is these two sexes are designed in such a way that they're complementary, right? Okay, so let's set up, a, let's take that minor premise and sort of then develop a yet another premise that we could say will be our real minor premise here. We could say, here's the syllogism. Based off of the natural effects of the use of the sexual functions, that is, based off of their finality, their purpose, the organs there are intended principally for procreation of children. That, that's that's. It seems like that's going to be a fairly uncontroversial, you know, conclusion. People will say maybe they're for other things or not, but that's that's our that's our assertion here. That's our minor premise for the syllogism. Well. Okay, there's other effects. Yeah, pleasure. Fact is pleasure plus the release of those chemicals. We talked about oxytocin, endorphins, dopamine, et cetera. These are going to help mates to bond together. The release of that passion then helps calm it. So concupiscence is it. But those are clearly secondary effects. The primary purpose, the reason that, that human beings and animals engage in reproductive acts is to reproduce. 
And so aside from this purpose of procreation, while there may be other functions, they're always going to be secondary. Okay, that's a little sort of support for the minor premise here. Major premise. We go back to what we talked about before with moral objects. The moral object, that is the thing to which an action primarily and firstly naturally tends, is going to set the morality of an action. We have to go there first. It's not the circumstances. It's not the intent of the person who's acting, the agent. It's the moral object. And in sexual actions, the moral object is procreation. And so those kinds of things, that's our major premise. We've taken our minor premise in that the acts tend towards that. The conclusion is going to be, naturally, that sexual actions, which of their nature tend towards procreation, that is, they don't impede procreation, that's important to say, they can be morally good. Sometimes they're not going to be. Circumstances and tension will deviate them. But the, we, the moral object firstly sets that sexual actions, which of their nature tend towards procreation, that is, they don't impede it, can be good if the other factors like circumstances and intention are good. And we can take a kind of contrafactual to that. We can turn that conclusion around and say, well, if that's the case, then sexual actions, which of their nature impede procreation, are always going to be morally evil, no matter the other factors, because the moral object ends up being evil. So that's, I think, where we set up, we could say, the general principle that we're going to set for more or less determining how Catholic, how the Catholic teaching matches up with the natural law and how things, how reality really is, in order to understand why its conclusions make a lot of sense. It's pretty simple when you start with, like you said, with, with the basic, what, what is the reason for this thing? It is this. Mm -hmm. Therefore, if it follows this, then it is, then it is moral or, or it yeah. can be moral or broadly it is mm -hmm. moral. Yeah. Um, it, go ahead. I, I was just thinking, and I'm not sure why I'm thinking this. Maybe it was that uh, sometimes we, we make dinner uh, one of the evenings here at the Priory for the, for the priest. And we have a, some games and various other things to kind of just have a relaxing evening and a good camaraderie together. I was thinking of smash burgers you know, where you take the meat and oh, yeah. just kind of smash it out and it gets really crispy and everything yeah. like that. And I'm not sure I was thinking that because we haven't made them here, but I was thinking perhaps in the future making them. Yeah. And I remember seeing that somebody did this, but they didn't have some kind of, uh, what, what would you say? A little, you know, metal thing like you find at a, at a diner, like they used the to burger do, press. press it down. Yeah. yeah, burger press like that. They didn't have that. So they used a culinary brick. And the culinary brick was a brick wrapped in aluminum foil, right? It looks, it's heavy. It works, right? It works. But that's not a book to the as far to smash burgers down, right? You can use it for that. And and maybe, okay, it's useful for that. But the person who designed a brick back in, I don't know, Mesopotamia back in the day right. when they started baking these things um, to use for building houses, that's not what a brick's for. It could be used for that, but that's not what a brick's for. Right? Yeah. And so it's, it's okay, um, you have a brick. What's a brick for? Well, a brick for building. It's also for maybe throwing through a window if you need to escape or something like that. <laughs> You're looking to vandalize the place. But it also can be used. I mean, that's not the primary function, but it can be used to smash some burgers down. Uh, if you clean it off, or at least you put some aluminum foil there, perhaps. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, aside from the seriousness of the topic here, but yeah. the first question you ask is, if you want to determine whether you can do this with it, is, is that what it's for? Or is that not what it's for? Right. You, right. you see a little kid like, you know, picking picking up some random thing and like you know, sucking on it or something like that. You say that's not for that. Right. You don't right. you don't just chew. You don't chew on random things. You don't pick up that thing in the street and just chew on it. No, that's not we, what that's for. We do not swing the cat by its tail. We do not swing the cat by its tail. That is yeah. that is not that is not what a cat is for. These are words yeah. I have cat said as a father. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, the words like that even have to come out of your mouth, you know, yeah. you probably never thought when yeah. you were younger that that was right. going to have to, you were going to have to form those words and speak them forth at some point in time, right. but there you are. I mean, children are beautiful, they are a blessing, but sometimes they are a huge pain, which gets us into our next topic, Father, which is contraception. Ch children, children are there Sorry. for your sanctification. <laughs> Sorry, I probably should yeah. not make a joke about contraception in that case, but it did kind of fit perfectly. I'm sorry. Forgive me. I, I, I do know, and this is a bit of a joke, too, that when one priest I know, he was a very good priest, uh, he would hear children crying. He would just go ahead and kiss his cassock and, you know, it was his. 
<laughs> and one point in time, he told somebody, well, you know, he, he was complaining about the difficulties of family life. And he said, well, you chose your vocation and I chose mine. Yes. You know, so. Yes, but absolutely. No, it's, 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 it's a, it's a full segue and they, you know, and you do need to be, if we're going to be serious about something, you do have to have a little bit of lighthearted approach to it because the world is so silly these days. The world treats these things almost uber seriously. And, yeah. you know, the reality is reality. And the fact that natural, uh, the natural law is not being followed by so many is kind of, kind of hilarious that people, I mean, there are two examples in scripture where, again, we're not using this as a proof for anything, but there are two examples in scripture of where God laughs. And both of them are where people are doing stupid things and he gets to laugh at, you know, they're just, they're setting up their own destruction and their own humility in the future. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think there's, there's a reason to, to kind of, and if we, if we just kind of complain all the time about how evil the world is, we become pretty depressed. It's yeah. kind of good to have a chuckle at the fact that, you know, we've deserved a lot well, a lot of, you know, the, the punishment that will probably be coming to us for all of our sins. And yet God is still good with us and still giving us chances. It's, it's somewhat funny that he even allows us to have that, but there you go. Yeah. He's good. Yeah. And he does. Absolutely. So, anyway, so, to, to, so to for the conclusion, this whole idea of contraception. Yeah. So for the conclusion, so any, yeah. any sexual act, which outside of their nature impede procreation are immoral. So the first immoral, item that yeah. we'll talk about is, uh, I'm sorry, is always morally evil. Um, yeah. So is there moral evil? So, immoral is is more or less the same. Is saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay. And so then, therefore, and contraception that, is always immoral. Yeah. Contraception. Yeah. Right. Because what is it? It's intentionally taking this act, which is meant to be procreative, and intentionally making it non-procreative. It's intentionally trying to impede that, and that's even the case if it's not abortive patient, right? It, it, well, we'll talk later about the whole topic of abortion, but if it's not going to you know, provoke the death of an infant or the non-implantation in certain cases, as some of the chemicals do, um, it's, it's still going to be immoral. Why? The act is meant for procreation. It doesn't, it, you are intentionally trying to take it away and you're trying to get some secondary end in, or, in, in order to do so, prevent the primary end. It's not as if we're just saying, well, you know, the primary is probably not going to happen and maybe we're not really interested in it, but we're open to the idea that we kind of want the pleasure of this action. But saying, I don't want that end at all. And I'm going to do everything possible to stop that from happening. I don't want this to achieve its proper purpose. Instead, I want this other way. I want my own, my, my own end out of this. I'm choosing me. Um, it was pretty much what happened with original sin. I'm going to choose me. I, I know God says it this way. I know he has these rules, but I, I think my idea of what's better is better. Um, yeah, so drugs, chemicals, devices, techniques that intentionally prevent pregnancy, intentionally make the sexual act sterile, thus violate the very primary purpose of the action. They're always intrinsically going to be immoral. And of course, there will be people who come up with objections to that. We may address them in the future if you, if you think of any good ones here, or maybe they come to my mind. But um, but th there you go. So contraceptive, contraceptive sex is immoral. It just simply is, whether it's within a marriage or outside of marriage. It's going to always be that case. Mm -hmm. And so any other act which provokes this kind of pleasure, the sexual pleasure outside of intercourse, is going to also be immoral because it is non-procreative. So the problem with, with self-abuse, masturbation, um, the, it used to be called the solitary sin, in, in provoking that intentional pleasure while preventing the procreative end, because there's nobody else around for that, is going to separate the effect and the act from its purpose. It, it's taking two things that are meant to be together and, and intentionally moving them apart for our own pleasure, not for the end that God intended, not for the end that nature intends by these things. Pleasure is just an effect. It's there to help us to pursue this marital act, encourage the, the procreation, help to produce the secondary effects, but the pleasure isn't the purpose of the action. I mean, even with eating, for instance, I don't eat in order to give myself pleasure. I eat because I need to have food. I, I need to live. It's nice that pleasure accompanies it because sometimes when people make me certain meals and things like that, or I make it for myself, it tastes pretty terrible, right? <laughs> I still need to eat it, right? But so the pleasure in eating it and feeling satiated and full is part and parcel why we do these actions. You know, if, if it was just you know, it brought pain on us. We might not eat. We might die, 
right? Mm-hmm. Same kind of thing. If if the difficulties that come up with marriage weren't uh, offset in a certain case by some of this pleasure, then sometimes people wouldn't get married and wouldn't reproduce. Right? So these things are tied together to help encourage these things, not so we can get the our jollies in our own way how we want. It, it's precisely that these things have to follow have to follow the natural law, and they have to follow this principle that leads them to their proper end, which is procreation. Mm-hmm. Can we speak a little bit, Father, uh, about sexual acts outside of marriage, whether mm-hmm. they be homosexual or heterosexual? The church has a pretty bad rap these days about hating homosexuals, quote unquote, yeah. which the church well, does not. Uh, no, can not we at all. can we talk about that briefly? Sure. Um, I think prefacing this, and it's not something I even thought about in my notes, but throughout my years as a priest, short as they have been, I'm only just under seven years a priest now. I've met plenty of people who are very virtuous, but have these kind of these homosexual attractions or perverted, otherwise heterosexual or, or otherwise attractions, but they make a great effort to still live a chaste life. Um, we all have that obligation, every one of us, from the priest who says, I'm not going to marry and I'm going to try every day to live chastely and not put myself into temptation. When temptation hits me, I'm gonna to try to use virtue to escape it. Like I, I just, I've decided by my vows not to use those functions, to, to, to consecrate them in a particular way by non-use. Well, somebody who has an attraction that is unnatural, that is not normal, they have a duty just as much as everybody else, just as much as the teenage young man who has a duty to be chaste. Everybody has that duty. Now, it may be harder for some who have inclinations that are that are directed in a way that isn't isn't according to the natural law, right? Um, but homosexual actions or heterosexual actions, any kind of these actions that aren't procreative but do seek this pleasure outside of the proper the, the proper marital act in marriage are going to be immoral. The principles are just the same as we've enunciated above. Um, but I would say it's really important to understand, and this is why you could say the church does not hate homosexuals or those inclined that way. She hates the sin, just as she would hate the same kind of sins that would be done by heterosexuals or, yes. or anybody. It's it's right. I mean, she hates she hates when her clergy have violated their vows to commit sin, whether it's heterosexual or homosexual. She hates when people outside the church do this, when people inside the church do it, when she hates the sin, but she loves the sinner enough to actually even enunciate these principles, right? She wouldn't say, hey, by the way, that's going to not lead to your, your eternal happiness. So why don't you not do that? Why don't you instead live this way, which is going to actually make you even more happy than any pleasure you could have in this life, if you just follow these simple rules. And that's not going to get you there. So we're, we're trying to make sure that you don't you don't kind of step away from the, the end that God has intended for you. Right. Um, inclinations, attractions, they can be willfully refused. Like, I like chocolate. I, I have a somewhat disordered, uh, you know, disordered um, <laughs> inclination to eat chocolate and ice cream, right? Um, uh, if, if you look earlier in the podcast, and it's probably a good thing, I, I've, I've become somewhat slimmer over the various podcasts from last December. Did not. Why? Because I, I decided that maybe I needed to, you know, not eat so much chocolate and ice cream and, you know, be careful and various things like that, right? I saw that there was this disordered inclination to food, and I said, well, I need to have a much more ordered inclination to these things. And so you restrain yourself, you restrict yourself. Why? Because your, your eternal end and in the meantime, health is more important than those things. And so you put those passions in check, you put some rules in place and you just, you, you do what God wants you to do. You act virtuously. It's, so it's not inclinations that are the problem. We're all, dis, we're all inclined to certain things that are, that are immoral. In various other ways, I'm sure everybody could come up with some dark story where they they decided to seek after that evil thing or that other thing, and that's kind of what they like, and they know they can't do that. Um, but it's the actions; it's freely chosen actions that are immortal, 
It's not yes. inclinations. The inclinations are there to be control. There are wounds in our soul that we are meant to consecrate in a certain way so we can act virtuously. And so the church doesn't hate homosexuals at all, but she's not going to just, you know, pat them on the back and say, hey, you're doing such a great job doing these, these immoral actions that you're doing. She's going to say, no, you, like everybody else, need to live chastely. And maybe for you, it's going to be particularly hard. So we'll help you with these various other things. We're going to make sure you have access to confession, that you do these... She's going to have to take care of these things, but also warn people that these kinds of various kinds of normality, sexual, homosexual, no matter what, are going to lead towards our destruction. And we shouldn't we shouldn't pursue them as a right. Bottom now, line is, say, is every single one of us has a cross to carry some sort of inclination yeah. that is disordered in some form or another. And that's mm-hmm. called our capital vice, main vice. Yeah. Or you could right. say that's our it's a it, yeah, it's our it's our you could say um primary fault or something like primary that. Fault, that's, yeah. that's how Saint, Saint Ignatius talks about it. Um and, and, and that's yeah. that's how we save our souls is through that. Yeah. Saint Saint Paul says it pretty well when he says that you know he had this sting in his flesh and he asked for it to be gone. And he said, No, my grace is sufficient for thee. Yeah. Okay. That's it. And what the sting was, we're not exactly sure. Some people think it actually was a bit of a temptation towards some kind of sexual passions. Uh, I, I don't particularly think that necessarily, but maybe. But but he was he was chaste. He lived a single life, right? He had consecrated that. He was he was one of the only apostles who was not what was not married, right? The other ones, like St. Peter, were married, but they lived chastely after that. So mm-hmm. they're that's a whole nother topic with celibacy and priest, priesthood and various right. things. But you have St. Paul who says, I wish everybody were like me, but not everybody can be like me. Right? Yeah. So, but even if we're citing scripture there and St. Paul's stories and various other things, note very well, note very well. And this is really important for anybody listening to this. We've not based these conclusions that we've come up with here on any bit of revelation. We haven't said scripture says this or the Pope say this or various other. We've said the natural law teaches this. And if you just use your human reason with a little bit of common sense and this natural law, we know that the nature of the human body, the purposes of the actions there lead us to these same conclusions. It's not as these aren't religious doctrines. The, the religious doctrines reflect reality. And so the church teaches these things are immoral because they're immoral. Not her teaching doesn't make them immoral. Very important point. Okay. Um, an objection to this would be um, actually, I have a personal uh, anecdote to, to okay. establish this, this objection. And that is, I'll see uh, I, answer it. I have my, my, uh, maternal, uh, grandfather, God rest his soul. Mm-hmm. He, his first, his wife died and mm-hmm. he met another lady back in St. Mary's where we lived. And mm-hmm. at the age of 85 and she, at the age of 80 got married, there is mm-hmm. no way that that union could have been procreative. Therefore, Father, you are a hypocrite because not all marriage is procreative. Probably a hypocrite in a lot of different ways, but not on this point. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, that's you hear that. Well, okay, if if the marital acts for procreation, then would people who are over the age where they could procreate shouldn't be able to get married, right? The the marital act must be must be evil then, right? And plus, right? Not every time, not every time you, you know, a couple has uh, has sexual intercourse, are they going to conceive? First off, the church doesn't teach that this is the principle that we have to conceive every time. It's it's not a competition. Uh, it's it's also um, not that every action has to lead to procreation. It's that it has to be open to it. We often have to open to life and various other things. We're saying you, the action has to be naturally done so that it is as possible, or at least you aren't impeding anything that intentionally would lead you away from procreation. The principle is that sexual actions that don't impede procreation can be moral, but there are far more factors to consider there, uh, circumstances, various other things, right? Certain circumstances, like in the in public, that's that's wrong, right? Right, Because this is meant to be a unitive action between two spouses, which is a, a necessarily private thing. Uh, intention, I just want pleasure. I don't care about children. Like that's wrong. Because your intention's wrong now. But the idea was that moral object was that the, the action be open to whatever, to, to procreation. It be open to it, not it not impede it, right? Um, that it's a natural, that's impossible 
due to age, medical conditions, current pregnancy, right? And why he's pregnant. Oh, well, I guess you can't engage in the marital act now because she's already pregnant. But, but she actually has been pregnant for a little while and we didn't know that. And therefore, well, we've been committing serious sins for the last month. No, 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 no. It, these things still tend to, towards procreation, even if they can't reach the end. The effect won't happen. But the couple isn't introducing willfully things that are in there to impede that end. It still tends towards the end there. Okay. Um, I'm not particularly a good hunter. I've owned a bow. I've never owned a rifle, though I've shot plenty of them over the years. Um, while going hunting tends towards killing deer, and I'm sure Father Fullerton would be very happy to take me up to the Regina Chaley house and, very, and show me how to shoot deer and try to make me a better hunter, um, because of I'm being a terribly bad shot, probably about half blind and wearing contacts right now, not having a good bow or rifle at the present, right? Still, when I go out with a rifle or bow into the woods, I'm aiming to kill a deer. I may happen to do so. I may not happen to do so, but I'm still hunting. I'm still aiming to, to kill a deer and that's still hunting, right? So married couples who have normal marital relations by the same analogy here, open to life, do something moral, even if conception is not likely to happen because of various factors, right? And yes, okay, 80, 85, that's, that's pretty old, but then, you know, Abraham. So it's not impossible. And we do have natural situations where a, a woman in her 70s, I believe, I think that was the oldest mother. I remember in the Guinness Book of World Records when I was like a teenager reading through and going, what? Um, but there was, I think she was in her 70s when she conceived. Right? Yes. So we have examples where maybe it actually isn't so impossible. I know a couple that for the first three years of their marriage, they also didn't have a very stable living condition. They were in an apartment here, and then they moved to this other place, and they were building a house, and it didn't work this way. It was just kind of a mess. And then finally, they move into their house normally, and they they were very good Catholics, and they were kind of – she was suddenly lamenting the fact that she hadn't had a child yet in three years. And then all of a sudden, boom, 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 right? Sometimes providence sets this up. So, um yeah, it, it, important here, I think, that we we look at that. And this traditional morality, I can sign a little side point here. I remember a, a, one of the teachers here in a speech talking about Sitting Bull. And he was Catholic, by the way. Um, and he was a Lakota. And he, at one point in time later in his life, saw a bunch of uh, Lakota young men running around a field chasing a buffalo and thinking that they were hunting. And he was a great buffalo hunter, and he thought, he just sort of, it's it's the, the face palm kind of thing. Like, I'm the last Lakota. I, I, this, is, <laughs> this is all over. Tradition is over. This traditional idea about, about uh, marital relations and how spouses go, it's been passed down. And when you, when you think of it normally in its traditional way, it wasn't obsessive. We didn't even really mention this kind of stuff. It just was naturally taught by what we did. And it's only now in this sort of new way of conceptualizing things where people think that they're doing something virtuous and think that they're, they, they've come up with these new ideas and you have all of these you know, therapists and various other people's exploring sexuality and various other things that now it looks like they're hunting. No, they have no clue about the reality of and, and the depth of, which, of what God's created because they're not looking at things through the natural law and the, uh, the natural lens here. They're looking at things in a different way. Um, Side point. Um, so we talked about uh, I'm not able to be or not likely to conceive and how that's still moral because it still seeks that end. The church does teach, and it's natural law too here, that those who are not able to engage in the marital act, those who are impotent, not just sterile, but impotent, couldn't contract marriage because marriage is about this giving in of a right to acts over your own body for things that are proper to generation. And if you can't perform that act, you can't give away that right. You don't have it to begin with. So the impotent can't give that right. They per se can't have relations unless that impotence is solved where medical science might enter in and maybe marriage would be possible. So. Okay. That makes sense. Um, the next stage, I guess we would look at in, and again, not looking at Catholic teaching, not looking at revelation is just the fact that having uh, having parents, having two parents is absolutely necessary for, for the good of a family. I mean, every study mm -hmm. that has looked at this has come up with that same conclusion, whether it's secular or religious Indeed. or not. 
Yeah, and it's it will be the exception where you have a situation where a husband or a wife dies and you only have one parent for a little while before remarriage or or maybe they don't remarry. But that's that's the rarity. And, there, and God's grace does touch those things. I, I was meeting with somebody last week who was visiting from New Zealand, for instance, and, you know, her husband died and she is like. She has about 10 children, the youngest a boy. So how is he going to be raised well? Well, God's grace will take care of it. And the good example that are around for that. But, but that's an exception. That, that's, not, that's not the normal way things happen. And the studies do bear out that outside of those exceptions, when we, when we break the family, it makes a mess. Why? Um, it's the fair conclusion from natural law, the same kind of thing, right? Um, example. Um, marriage, like I said, is this contract, the exclusive rights over one's body that you give away. And because given exclusive, they can't be taken back. That'll be important for things like adultery and divorce. But divorce also brings in another problem here. The contract is total exclusive lifelong. Why is that the case? Well, think of it just and how we develop. A, a child, when it's conceived, normally is going to live for about nine months in its mother's womb. Sometimes less, sometimes more. Um, during that time, when a mother is pregnant, she's often, especially in the early days when morning sickness hits, and then the later days when she's, uh, you know, she's clearly uncomfortable and about to pop, right? Um, the normal function isn't so easy. And so she can easily get sick. She can be easily more injured. She needs more nutrition. Historically, that was somebody who was providing for her. Hunting and gathering is more difficult when you're pregnant. In other words, when pregnant, a woman is going to have difficulties to make her normal life and her needs met. And so particularly somebody, if she has a spouse, is going to who has a vested interest in this child, is going to be able to provide for her and help her. So it's good that she has this help and somebody who has an interest in the child. Once born, the child is now going to have very much, very diff, diff, lots of difficulties. Um, it's not as we're not as instinctual as other animals. So we take time learning a very long time to pass through infancy, childhood, adolescence, and eventually towards a point where we can kind of take care of ourselves. And as an adult, sexual maturity isn't going to happen until the mid teenage years, right? 10, 15, 20 years before we're really ready to have our own family. It's not nothing. And that is that's a difficulty that other animals don't have. Our rational nature means that we need to learn not just by instinct and sense memory, but also by reasoning. And so we need examples. We need to think through these things. Boys and girls are better formed into men and women by men and women. And so we, we start to see that this stable family where a mother and a father who conceive these children are present for their nurture, present for their growth, present for their development, these, this seems to be relatively necessary it's it's sort of an extension of the natural law. We're applying natural law. We're thinking about it now. Um, and I think that's a, that leads to a secondary conclusion that we can have, or various secondary conclusions that we can have about Catholic sexual morality here. And I would say the first one is any kind of sexual actions outside of marriage are wrong. Why? Okay. Why is what we call fornication, sexual relations outside of marriage? Why is this immoral? Why would we say it's always immoral? Well, act and acts that tend towards that also outside of marriage immoral. Well, okay, any, if we're not using contraceptives, and we've already said that's immoral, if we're not using contraceptives, then it, we risk through sexual intercourse outside of marriage, pregnancy, and conceiving a child outside that naturally stable union that we said is part of the natural law, part of what we, we, as, we as human beings need to be raised well. It's not so obvious in the earlier points, of course, here. It's an extended, you know, extended family could take care of the child or maybe, you know, takes a village to raise a child or, you know, various things we've heard in the past. Um, but studies do bear out the harm of the instability that's caused by not having a father and having a mother. And obviously, we said before, contraceptive fornication is, that's immoral from the earlier principles. Well, then in, we could also say if um, fornication is immoral, then all of the actions, imperfect as they may be, leading to that passionate kissing, impure touches, anything that intentionally rouses the passions, are also immoral to the degree that they're going to tend towards fornication. Why? Moral object again here. We're going back to our same principles, right? The moral object of these imperfect actions of a passionate kiss is to basically lead down that road to, to set up the arousal, the passion. So, you know, you eventually kind of lead to something more, right? That's the moral object of that action. 
Well, if you can't engage in the action that was the natural conclusion of, of that action, well, then you can't engage in the first action to begin with, because the moral object carries through all of these things. Circumstances and intention don't change anything. But she's really pretty, and I don't want her to leave, and et cetera. Well, too bad, right? The primary purpose of passionate kissing, sensual touching, is to arouse the passions. And those passions are aroused in order to engage in marital relations. But remember, the unmarried are not allowed to get, engage in marital relations. And so everything beforehand, at least to the extent that it is a real risk for that arousal of the passions, is wrong. Immoral. The Catholic Church teaches that, but natural law establishes that as well. Also establishes that adultery is immoral. I, okay, it's not only against justice, but now it risks a child born outside of a stable family and introducing now a, a, into the common life of the husband and wife, a third party who has an interest in this child. And it represents, this child will continually represent the infidelity that's been happening. It's going to war against those secondary ends of marriage, the unity of the spouses. Right? So same thing, imperfect actions, like a man flirting with, uh, with uh, the woman, the pretty woman at the, at the water cooler at work, right? Well, if he's married, that's wrong. Why? Because that naturally tends towards adultery, and that adultery is wrong. So you can see that the same principle goes throughout. It's not as if we're creating new arbitrary rules throughout. It's the same principle that runs throughout the entirety of this. Mm -hmm. Same reason divorce is immoral. Why? Breaks up that stable relationship. Remarriage wars against this notion of marriage being stable to begin with. It introduces now non-interested parties into this mix. Surrogacy, immoral. Why? The marital act is, is not only ordered towards children, but towards those secondary ends as well. And allowing a surrogate to carry your child certainly damages the unity of those spouses, introduces that third party again into this whole that has a major role in this child's life. And even worse, surrogacy is either going to require adultery or self-abuse, masturbation, in order to conceive the child. So it's starting with immoral acts. And as we've said before, you can't have, you have a whole continuum for moral actions. When you start evil, nothing can vitiate that evilness. But an evil later can vitiate the good that was starting with. So evil actions to begin with in this whole surrogacy, it can't become good. Even if the, the bearing of a child is good, even if we will baptize a child who's conceived in a bad way, even if we'll take care of that soul, the church doesn't hate these souls, it hates the sin. Same as what we were saying before, right? The church doesn't want to encourage sin, but she does want to, of course, take care of those so they don't fall into sin. So maybe they, they don't make the same mistakes that their parents made. I can say we can add to this too, right? So we've we've had this whole sort of thought process. What about a prevalent problem today? It's most web, web searches will find this. And I think at some point in time in the future, we have a we'll probably have a, a society priest on to give some give parents some pointers and various other things on this. I know one of those society priests has sort of taken this up to help protect children from from pornography and the problems thereof. Well, pornography is immoral. And why? Okay, this marital act that we were talking about is meant to be an intimate act for procreation, creation with God. Parents are engaging in this, in this act of creation together with God, who infuses the soul where they provide the material, they provide the body, right? So it's, there's a kind of natural sacredness about this action. It's going to naturally be sacred. Why? Because this this action leads to um, leads to a participation with God in creation, right? And so, if it's naturally sacred, publicizing it, sharing it, is grossly immoral, and it's unnatural. This isn't natural. You don't just go and perform in front of other people. No one would ever do that, right? Of course, there's added to this that pornography involves oftentimes very much many unnatural actions, adultery, contraception human trafficking, prostitution, and a myriad of other evils that are introduced into there. The actors themselves, oftentimes led by their shameless life, are led by their shameless life to a, a drug and other addictions to try to deaden the psychological harm that, and the pain that's caused by this. And every time we consume pornography, we promote those evils. So even the consumption of it, not just the production of it, is a great evil because we're we're materially cooperating in in this evil so oh, not not just materially formally, formally cooperating yeah. in it. as consumers of the product we're promoting the production of the product yeah right it would be like if if you are consuming poison 
and you say, I have a great demand for poison, you're 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 encouraging people to produce that poison. So those are those are the uh, that's sexual morality. We've basically touched, I think, mm-hmm. on just about everything. Again, there's there's plenty more that that could be discussed, and, and that's for another time. Human nature will create plenty more yeah. problems, but yeah, I think I think we've exhausted that topic at least for yeah. now. Uh, the whole second half of this, and we're going to go through this part fairly quickly, uh, and because we're going to be going through it pretty quickly, I'd, I'd like to draw the uh, listeners' attention to the fact that Angelus Press did a whole conference on the topic of life, covering every single one of these issues, Father, that you're talking about. Uh, audio recordings mm-hmm. are available on this at angelespress.org. I think it was the 2018 conference was the one on life. Yeah. And there was another one, for instance, on the pornography topic we just talked about. Father Kilcally yes. talked about that. And it was a very good conference about some of the difficulties and problems and yeah, and what, what needs to happen to, to, to protect people. So there are good resources out there, even if we're going to go yeah. quickly through So things. go to angelespress.org, look up conference audio. It's the 2018 conference. Highly recommended. Anyway, so... Let's look at other life issues, Father. Uh, Where do you want to start? Well, I think we need to start with who is the Lord of life, right? We need to ask that question, a key preliminary. A lot of objections are answered simply by that. We need to go back to the second way of St. Thomas Aquinas. I don't remember if that was talked about earlier in the podcast, but this is the argument from the existence of a thing and its cause. We say God exists. Why? Anything that doesn't have an existence of itself has to receive it from another. We call that its efficient cause. Something doesn't simply exist. It has to be given existence if it doesn't simply exist. And that efficient cause either has to be the first cause, which simply exists, or it has to be somewhere along the line. And this chain of cause is there because nothing is its own cause, not even God. We said, who caused God? Well, that's a stupid question. No one, God is not caused, right? Okay, this chain here leads to the end. So we can say this chain can't be infinite. Why? If I have a chandelier and I have this chain leading from the chandelier to the anchor point, I have a first link that then is linked to all the other links and a last link. If instead of that first link, I try to say, well, the the chain's infinitely long, but that doesn't explain why the lamp is or the chandelier is hanging there. It in fact should still fall because there's nothing, we're, we're saying there is no end to that chain. So the chain has to end somewhere. No matter how long it is, it has to have a first link and a last link, and everything in between can be kind of compressed down to that. So that's a proof for God. Why? God is the uncaused cause. Okay. But if God is the uncaused cause, he is creator of all things. And if he's creator of all things, he gives existence to all things, including us. He is the master then of the existence. He's the Lord, as it were, of everything, including this special kind of existence that animals and we have called life. And we're going to be able to show from that that God as the master of life, therefore grants to those to whom he gives this life a kind of stewardship, especially in our case where we're rational creatures, where we can think and we can will and we can direct ourselves towards an end. So that's why we're stewards over this life. A kind of objection we could have here is, well, okay, well, if God has the right over life and we're just stewards of it, God of the Old Testament kind of told a bunch of people to, told the Hebrews to wipe out a bunch of people, <laughs> even women and children who were not guilty of any crime, yeah. right? How could a loving God do this? It's, it's, it's unfortunately, it's kind of a side point here and we won't spend very long on it because I don't, there's enough already here and there's enough to talk about. It's, it's really not an objection to God as Lord of life. It's really a a perversion of the idea of justice here. Nevertheless, it's a common objection. Okay, let's presume God does command those in certain cases. Well, if he commands that, he's master of life, and it belongs to him to decide when we're going to die and when we're going to live. Um, many people will die, very innocent. They'll die in a humanly inopportune moment, but in a divinely opportune moment, so they save their soul. Example of this, I, I was t- t- to bring this up. St. Thomas More, a very good man, but he was pretty much a humanist, right? And his, one of his good friends, Erasmus, ends up a heretic. Why? Because of his ideas about utopia, et cetera, right? If he didn't end up dying when he did, who knows if he hadn't had that persecution that forced him to stand up for the Catholic Church and, and for marriage. And if he didn't have to do that, then maybe he would have also followed Erasmus into heresy, as good as he was. Maybe he would come up with these bad ideas. So we don't have the full context. God does. We know certainly that those were killed in the Old Testament in these cases where the Hebrews were doing this. 
were committing all kinds of heinous crimes and idolatry, child, child murder and various other things and just punishment. So secondly, what if the Hebrews were just embellishing? Right. Uh, certain times we, I mean, scripture is is God's word. It's true, but we do know that the Hebrews did have a tendency to go a little too far at some times. Um, Simeon um, and Levi decided to use circumcision as a weapon. They were kind of punished for that against Sikkim. Um, we know the Israelites sometimes didn't follow through in God's commands. So it's you know, in such cases, God is still a master of life and death, and He can certainly use bad people to do good, important things and bring about a punishment. Attila, scourge of God, Julian the Apostate trying to destroy the Catholic Church, right? Who we thought of the Catholic Church was actually the Arians, put the Catholic bishops back in their seas. So it was the apostate who ended up restoring the church. And God can see through these things. God is the master of life. So we can see where he can take evil, death, and he can turn it into actually good things sometimes. So God's the master of life. It belongs to him to decide when a man is going to live and he's going to die. No, we haven't invoked revelation. If we have some stories here, natural law says that the creator has a mastery over right. life. So what's our role? Yeah. Our role is as stewards. Creatures are just given existence. We're not owed it. We didn't do anything for it. The, the principle of merit needs to be there for us to mimic, but we're not alive yet. So we didn't exist. We can't we merit existence. Right? And anything good we do worthy of merit has to require the help of God anyway. We're at best stewards of our life and our body, our supernatural life and our natural life and our body. We've been given this special form of life, which includes uh, a spiritual life, a bodily life, um, and we have to take care of both of those. Um, even if we're just going to consider the Aristotelian end, the natural end of things here, not, not a supernatural end at all, we still need to contemplate God for all eternity just not face to face. Aristotle came up with that. So we don't need revelation to show us that we have an end that we need to seek out, we need to seek for. Um, and, and that's gonna set all of these other principles here. We have to preserve this life. Um, we have to worry about our supernatural life now that we know that it exists. That's the only part of revelation there. And so if we're a steward of life, we're not an owner, we're a steward, we have rules. The, the owner has set some rules for how things are supposed to go. And as a social creature, too, we have responsibilities to others. Okay, so we'll draw some quick conclusions from these, some of which aren't very convert controversial, some which will be, okay. uh, unfortunately. Hmm. Murder. Immoral. Can't do murder. Right. right. Why? Man doesn't own another's life any more than he owns his own. And so he has no right to take the other's life any more than he does his own. This is why suicide will be wrong later, too. Now, the only debate here constitutes what is innocent, what is unjust, and so what is murder? Because murder is the killing of an unjust, or unjust killing of an innocent, sorry. Um, a just war being fought. The enemy combatant turns out to be not so innocent anymore because they're a soldier. Fighting against them in battle to the point of death is not murder. Right? Executing prisoners is murder. Why? Because they're no longer an unjust aggressor against you. They, they can't be put to death. You see plenty of times where it's like, oh, yeah, we capture them. We're just going to shoot them. No, can't do that. That's immoral. Um, capital punishment along those same lines also is not murder. It's kind of a controversial point, unfortunately, these days. Um, the state has been given this. Why? How do we know this? Understanding Catholic doctrine and scripture. Genesis 9.6. Whoever sheds man's blood by, by man, will his blood be shed? Even the words of Christ tells Pilate, who has told him he has the power to put him to death. You would not have power were it not given to you from above. And we have the idea that the state has this authority to execute criminals in certain cases. Now, if, if we look at the modern teachings of the church and the wishes of the popes, we get a slightly different story. John Paul II started this idea. There's a prudential side. He suggests the death penalty. It's not any more necessary because, well, we can imprison criminals for a long time, much more easily nowadays. We don't need to kill them. That's not the reason for the death penalty, though. It's, it's maybe a good prudential point, and, and maybe there's something to that, but it's not the reason we have the death penalty. Punishment produces two, four effects. It prevents future crimes by, by putting the person, you know, this is the capture of the person, et cetera prevents future crimes. It restores to society for the harm done to the common good and to society. It reforms the criminal, or at least provokes that hopefully, and it deters others from committing the crime. Um, the argument ignores all of those goods in, that flow from punishment, 
even if the death penalty in certain cases may not be most opportune. Uh, Dr. Fazer, Dr. Edward Fazer, good, um, good uh, Thomistic theologian, well, more a philosopher, I would say. He has a really good treatment on this in um, his By Man Shall Man, By His Blood Be Shed. Um, really good defense of the traditional Catholic position on these things. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Pivoting from there. Murder's wrong. So abortion and infanticide are immoral. Abortion here has to be defined as the unjust killing of an unborn child. It's a particularly grave kind of murder. It's particularly wrong. The principles are the same for murder. You can't take another's life. But we should be clear here what we mean by abortion. Traditionally, this term is a much wider idea because it could, you know, a spontaneous um, uh, miscarriage would be considered in traditional terms an abortion. And that obviously is not immoral. No one's done anything there. There's no choice in that. Abortion here, what we mean is the intentional and direct killing of a child in the womb through physical, chemical, or other means. Abortion that's not an indirect, that is, abortion is an indirect killing, okay? Um, you, this is a common thing that's brought up, I'm sure you're familiar with it, with the idea of an ectopic pregnancy, right? The idea of a pregnancy that doesn't implant correctly and actually causes a danger for the, the woman of her death. And so uh, cephalonectomy, which is the removal of a part of a, or a whole part of a fallopian tube, or even a hysterectomy in certain cases, is necessary to treat this, perhaps a cancerous uterus. Even if you remove, though, the organ, you're not directly killing the child. It's a little different if I shoot somebody in the head or if I put them in a place where they might die, right? There's, there's a, I'm causing the death directly in one case and not indirectly in the other case. This is the example of double effect that we've talked about before. I refer you back for the principles to the earlier episode. We save the mother's life by treating a disease. The unintended secondary effect is the death of the child. We would like to save the child if that were possible. Maybe medical technology will allow that at some point in time. The effect of a chemical or surgical abortion is to kill the child to treat the mother. You can't do evil that good come from it. You can do good even if evil comes from it sometimes. This is the idea here. Um, so we could say here, because of this, an abortion is never necessary. And the debate over this whole thing, we talk about it as, well, what about the life of the mother or these other cases? It's never necessary, even to save the life of a mother, because there are ways of treating that don't involve the direct killing of a child. It's just a more convenient and sterile way of doing things that ends up implicating people in murder. We can't do that. Right. And it's a far worse kind of murder, too. Right? It perverts not only the natural law and killing, but it perverts that natural maternal parental relationship that's supposed to happen there. It's another reason why it's a violation of the natural law on that level. And it's also why it causes, and when you talk to women, a lot of Catholic priests oftentimes do this, who have had abortions, they are damaged, badly so, and they never recover from that. They can sometimes sort through those issues, but they never truly recover. And there was always that wound there. And, and so it, it's because of just this. I killed my child. There's not really any getting over that. Um, uh, there's, you can sort through it. You can compartmentalize it. You can try to move on. But you can't really get over that as it were. Right. And, and, and uh, just, just to clarify real quick, Father, you're not saying that you don't want women to not get over it. You're saying the church welcomes you back with open arms. You would welcome any woman who is gone through this, done this thing and, and a hundred percent help as much as possible for her to be forgiven her sin, be forgiven and absolved of the excommunication that's attached to abortion, yes. uh, for having obtained it to do go, you know, to help her to do the penance to even, okay. And, and as a priest, sometimes this happens, somebody comes in and they're overburdened with this thing, but a great penance is necessary in order for them to help. Okay. Well, I'll say you do this. I'll do the rest. I'll take on that myself. This is, you know, this is what we do. Our life is supposed to be prayer and penance. So we say, we do this kinds of things. You, you need help in getting over this. I'm going to provide you all the help possible. Come back and we will help you. Yes, you'll have that wound. You'll be able to sort through it. You'll be able to see the good that God somehow has drawn out of it. And you'll be able to know that your child perhaps is is in limbo and 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 happy, but even if it's not a supernatural happiness. But but we will help you through this. It, it, you'll be wounded, but it's okay. You know, Christ is wounded in heaven. He has his wounds, and and they're glorious because he he has they've been glorified. And when we have our wounds that we take to heaven, they are glorious because it's God working through us, working through our faults to 
make us something better. No, of course we we want we want such a woman back. We want to help her as best as we can. Yeah. Um, I did mention an excommunication there. There is an automatic excommunication attached to that. Um, it's worth looking into. Unfortunately, we could excommunicate politicians who vote for this kind of stuff, but that's not automatic. It has to be a, an, for an individual particular abortion. Because it's so hidden and horrendous, the church wants to emphasize this is bad. Uh, not because we teach it, because it's, an, it's naturally provable to be bad, to be evil. Uh, sorry. We could also go into here, I think. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. No problem. Sorry. I was just going to say, okay, so the um, next topic then we would look at would be uh, suicide. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't own our own suicide, life. Therefore, yeah. we can't take it away. Same principles. Yeah. We can't, we don't own our own. We're stewards. Um, we've been given a certain number of talents as the parable and the gospel goes, and we're supposed to give them back in the end with, with interest, right? We're supposed to have developed our talents in this life. We don't get to decide, no, nope, you're not getting the talents back. Um, we don't get to decide the time or anything. That's suicide here is the direct killing of oneself, not the indirect killing. There's a great story. I encourage people to read up on it. I think there's some good podcasts from some, you know, uh, his motivational speakers on this, of, of the story of Michael Mansour, Catholic man, very, very devout man. I think his cause for canonization has been opened. Um, he was a soldier in, in Ramadi. He is on a rooftop. He's part of the SEALs team. Uh, insurgents throw up a grenade. It hits him in the chest and bounces in front of him. He could escape down the stairwell right next to him. St concrete stairwell probably be okay. His uh, his mates wouldn't have done that, and they could they would have been killed by this. He shouts grenade, jumps on it. He's wounded, not killed in, in instantly, um, and he suffers for about a half an hour before he finally dies. Um, very very devout man, Catholic, prayed his rosary every day. He's spoken of very highly. This great act of sacrifice actually is probably what would have earned him a, a you know a ticket to heaven as or plus all of his devotions etc we don't know we'll leave that to to the church to figure out there but um that's not suicide offering one's life allowing oneself to be killed is not directly killing oneself right i can't throw a grenade into you know hold a grenade to my chest because you know i will less lessen the burden on others but i can protect others by by jumping on the grenade um and we should say with suicide here, it's so often, and as a priest, you get to see this too too often too. It's so often tied up with mental illness, and and you know, and really horrific cases um, that um, we don't necessarily judge in all these cases. We don't give a Catholic funeral to somebody who's died by suicide, traditionally speaking, um, but we do still we still can hope for their salvation that somehow they weren't responsible. Um, that that these the psychological pain and these mental illnesses have taken away any culpability. Sure. Here. So if suicide's immoral, assisted suicide and euthanasia also is same principles, except now you're involving somebody else in here, and that's even in the case of psychological pain or 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 physical pain. Right. Just because you're going to die soon doesn't give you the right to speed that up. Doesn't give you the right to do it. Do that now. We don't. We're not. We're not the owner of our life. We're just a steward. The steward doesn't decide when he's going to cash in the check. That's the owner. Right? Um, same kind of thing here, right? Um, if abortion's wrong, then we could take this to fetal tissue and stem cells, right? Immortal. Why? They're obtained by the direct killing of the child. Organ transplantation, another life issue. Why? Because in order to obtain these organs right now, you usually have to, the person donating them has to still be alive when they're taken. So certainly taking things like hearts and lungs that people need to survive is killing them in order to get their organs. Um, now, and brain death is not death. The soul leaves when the body stops. When the soul leaves, is it's not clear until we see decay. And by then, it's too late to recover some of these organs. Um, and so... We, we have an issue there. Catholic bioethics setting out principles. In fact, by doing this and saying you can't do that, end up hopefully directing science towards moral ends. But maybe we can. We do we do 3D print burgers now. Maybe we can 3D print some of these, yeah. these organs. Maybe we can grow some of these organs. It's very common, too, that um, when you have brain surgery, for instance, they take part of your skull off. What, where do they put it to be so it, it doesn't die? The cells don't they die. They stick it in your abdomen. Hmm. Right? There, there's ways that medical science it can be very innovative, but it, basically the Catholic Church says, based off of natural principles, hey, here's a little pen over here in which you will find the truth. This over here that you're thinking about will help you. It won't help you. Stop looking over there. Don't waste your time on that. That's immoral. 
look here, here's where you're going to find the truth and the answer. The Catholic Church promotes science in that way by, by trying to keep scientists and medical science in particular from going off the rails. Right? And if we only looked over here and focused our effort, maybe we would find ways where we could harvest these organs, and be a bad way of saying it. We could take these organs without killing people, or we could preserve them after death. So then we could use them afterward. But no, but no, we, we like it the way we like it. We want to do all this other research now. We don't want to follow moral principles, unfortunately. And, and that's, that's quite sad because it, it actually is anti-science. It doesn't help us develop. Sure. Absolutely. Um, one other main point that we'd like to touch on before we close here is not necessarily the taking of life, but the damaging of life through alcohol or mm -hmm. drugs. And that is immoral. We, mm -hmm. we did already have a podcast with Father Robinson uh, some months ago talking about Indeed. the immorality of marijuana usage. But uh, broadly speaking, mm -hmm. why is this wrong? Right. The same principles here. Naturally, we are we we fall asleep in various other things. We stop using our reason, but we're men of intellect and will. We have to keep those kinds of things. And so using intoxicating substances, medicines, or various other drugs and various other things, we can use these provided they don't they don't result in the loss of our reason or our intellect or, or our will, um, unless there's a good reason for that, right? Um, in, in the past, you know, you had to have a surgery, here's the bullet, here's some whiskey, uh, okay, you know, bite down and, and hope that the, uh, hope that the uh, alcohol, you know, helps you. If, if people today are have methanol poisoning, you drink some wood alcohol or some, you know, something that's off, they will, you go to the hospital, they're going to fill you through, fill it with ethanol, they're going to get you drunk. Why? Because your body won't process the methanol, it'll process the ethanol and you'll excrete this poison without going blind. Right. So at certain times, we're going to have these drugs and various other things that are intoxicating. We will lose our reason as a result of using these things for a better reason, our health. Right. But we don't get to self prescribe these things. We, we want a medical need. There has to be a medical professional that enters in here. Otherwise, we will just say, oh, yeah, no, no, I need a little need a little relief. Right? No. Recreational use of this stuff is different, though. Those are moral only if it doesn't impair our reason or, or lose it. Right. So drinking moderately, using tobacco moderately, various other things that don't cause harm to us, fine, right? And it actually can, can enliven and it can help social relations in that. We, we want to drink because we're happy, not to get happy, important thing there. Um, so if we impair our reason, now we've, we've done something immoral. If we've lost our reason, we've definitely done something immoral. Um, so that's with drinking, with drugs, or various other things. Um, I think Father Robinson brought up, I um, haven't listened to the podcast too recently, but I think it's one of the important points that marijuana is a different case than drinking or tobacco. Why? Even if it's less addictive per se, um, today's pot isn't your uh, grandpa swamp weed, put it that way. Um, that was about 5%, maybe 6% THC, sometimes lower. Um, most varieties today are about 30%. Mm -hmm. They've been bred to get you high. Um, they've been bred, bred so you lose your reason. Um, and not only that, there's serious effects psychologically and physiologically beyond there, especially for those under 25. They can really damage brains and development. So it can truly be said that, you know, weed can really make you dumb. Like yep. it, because it does, you know, if you're under 25, it can cause serious problems. And, and science is bearing that out too. This is not just my opinion. Studies show this. Medical studies that aren't Catholics trying to push our morality on people show this. Yeah. Right? Um, so this is why we say, generally speaking, as a conclusion, marijuana use is immoral, recreationally, that is. And we priests in confession are going to treat it as a mortal sin unless there's extenuating circumstances, which rarely there are. Carnal drugs, of course, are out, especially illegal ones, because now we're violating the law. Now we're, we're violating we're, and we're associating with this kind of otherwise evil thing, too. Yeah. So... No, that's a, that's a lot. We've we packed into nearly an hour and a half here, a bunch of moral topics, but I think they're important ones and they do draw out from a lot of the principles we had before there. But note, the entire time until the very end when we talked about how priests treat things in confession, do we say the Catholic Church teaches that this is wrong and so it's right. wrong, right? right? No. We've been going through this whole thing, the Catholic Church teaching this as a warning to us, hey, this is going to lead you away from your end. Your end is this and that's that's not going to get you there, right? It, she doesn't cause wrongness because her doctrines say that. She reflects the wrongness of reality so men can be guided towards their goal. 
And most other basic questions, I know we've only kind of done a really kind of a lightning round, even if it's been a long storm here, um, a lightning round to try to hit some of these things. Basic questions of morality are pretty easily answered by thinking about these same principles of finality. It's rare that there are those more complex questions, but when they are, that's why you have something like a church founded by Christ. Why? To answer those kinds of things in a definitive manner. Right. And this is maybe a, a lead into when we talk more about the church and the magisterium. Perhaps we've done a little bit of that before. Perhaps we will in the future. That's why you have a guiding church, a mother who is taking care of you and these more things that, are, that kind of exceed our, our, normal, um, our normal understanding of things. Father, that was, uh, that was impressive. It was complex and you got it all done in, uh, in just about an hour and a half. So thank you so much. Well, hopefully it's understandable. No, That's the- it, it is. I was, I was able to track it and follow it. And, and of course we have all the notes available at uh, sspxpodcast.com yeah. too. So people okay. can follow along there as well. So thank you so much for putting this together. I know it was a slog to get this all put together for us. So thank you. Uh, October, November in particular, are always busy months for priests. Yeah. So we, we, we've, we've, we've managed to get to the end. Fantastic. Huzzah. Father, have a wonderful weekend. We appreciate your time. All right. God bless you. you. Thanks. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Apologetic Series on the SSPX podcast and on our YouTube page. Please consider subscribing to the YouTube account and the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever fine podcasts are found. And please consider leaving a rating or a review on this podcast. This will help to make sure more people can find this podcast and discover the beauty and the truth of traditional Catholicism. Until next time, thank you for joining us and God bless you.